Of all the directors who have worked in the film industry, there are few who have left as significant of a mark on cinema as Stanley Kubrick. In his career spanning 48 years, he directed 13 feature films. While each of his films are unique in regards to genre and story, there is something about Kubrick's direction which sticks out in the mind. While there are several factors to his direction including his use of large-scale themes and contrapuntal music, I think the answer can be found in his most iconic moments. Kubrick's use of framing. When you look at all of his films, even though they all have one thing in common, for me anyway, the craft is impeccable. Every film he's ever made, the craft is impeccable. You know, you know, there's the compositions. I mean, the exact compositions. You had to hit your mark precisely to please Stanley so he would get his painting, the painting he was putting on canvas for you. Stanley Kubrick's approach to directing a scene is rather straightforward. Whenever he can, he will avoid the movement of both the characters and camera. The easiest way to understand Kubrick's direction style is actually to take a look at how he frames inanimate objects. The object is shot dead center in the frame. It can move on its axis, or the background can move. But the framing never changes. When the characters or central object in a scene stay in place, Kubrick will opt to use symmetry to make the shot more picturesque. When the characters do move, the camera follows, but the framing doesn't change. I didn't know he was a still photographer before. I've read over the years, uh, uh, Steve Spielberg told me about him and that sort of thing. And I said, of course, the still photography, once you get that image, but then it moves. Still cameras don't move. His most famous method for maintaining the framing of a shot is to use tracking shots. Today, tracking shots usually adjust going from shot to shot, from a medium close-up, to a close-up, to a medium close-up, to a wide, and so on. It's a great way to show off your direction. But Stanley Kubrick never shows off with his tracking shots. They are used to show a scene as it is, not how it could be. In nearly every tracking shot found in Stanley Kubrick's filmography, you'll notice that the characters stay central to the frame while they move through the environment. Whether it's from the right, from the left, the front, One, two, three, four, I love the ring or the back. Wherever the characters are moving, the camera follows them at the same speed and the framing stays even to keep the focus on the characters. While the camera tends to follow characters with relentlessly even framing, this doesn't mean that the camera can't move at all. Kubrick loved using zoom-ins and zoom-outs to enhance a shot or strengthen the meaning of it. In Barry Lyndon, he uses an immense amount of zoom-outs to establish a vastness of scale, while in The Shining, zoom-ins are used to build tension. Because of how persistently Kubrick used tripod and tracking shots, handheld is far more noticeable in his films. It's always used whenever a character is in massive distress. Therefore, the perfect place to use it is in a fight scene. Commence fighting now! Or how about just flat out war? Whenever Kubrick uses handheld, he draws specific attention to it because handheld always has a purpose in the story which is translated through his direction. The rarest shot in a Kubrick film is a close-up of an inanimate object. He only uses it when the item shown on screen is absolutely pivotal to the scene. Usually a close-up of an item is used to build tension. You should be careful with those things. It's not loaded. Dr. Strangelove has the most close-ups of inanimate objects out of Kubrick's filmography, most likely because every button pressed on a bomber plane matters. Aside from that, Kubrick rarely uses this framing method, so when it arrives, you know the shot means business. When it comes to characters, on the other hand, close-ups are crucial to conversation scenes. When two characters are exchanging dialogue in a scene, Kubrick will always hold a wide for as long as he can. One simple method he uses to avoid the cut is using a mirror to enhance the depth of a shot. It makes it so that you can focus on both characters in the scene at the same time without cutting back and forth. Aside from making the background interesting, Kubrick will also use the moment of the characters to avoid close-ups and cuts. In this scene from Barry Lyndon, Kubrick holds the shot on Lady Lyndon while she is playing cards. Her eyes move down at this moment and divert the focus of the audience to the props on the table. However, the shot continues to hold until Kubrick decides to cut for intimacy between characters at which point he opts for a close-up of Redmond's face. Sometimes you can see the rhythm of the cutting and the camera moves. And when he cuts in a two-shot conversation, 
the classic one is Mr. Grady yeah. and um, Jack Torrance in the bathroom, right, right. Uh, crossing the invisible line. Right, right, with right. With the red background, yeah. uh, the cuts, and uh, when he cuts, when he destroys the invisible line, and when the shot gets tighter, on which line of dialogue? So let's dissect an early scene from Dr. Strangelove and take a look at how Kubrick constructs a scene between two characters. Mandrake enters the scene with information he wishes to share to General Ripper. Something rather interesting has just cropped up. Listen to that. Music. Civilian broadcasting. This establishing wide shot holds for three minutes and one second to show that both characters are on an even playing field. When Mandrake tells Ripper about the radio, he walks to the door and locks it. As Mandrake continues to talk to Ripper, he begins to suspect that he has sinister motives. You see it. If a Russian attack was in progress, we would certainly not be hearing civilian broadcasting. Are you certain of that, Mandrake? No, that's a bit bothered of mine. That's and what if it is true? If a Russian attack was not in progress, then your use of Plan R, in fact, your order to the entire wing, well, I would say, sir, that there was something dreadfully wrong somewhere. The framing enforces this by leaving Ripper's face mostly hidden from the camera. Mandrake attempts to leave the scene, but realizes that Ripper has locked him in. When Mandrake demands information from Ripper for the last time in the scene, I'm the only person who knows the three-letter code group. Then I must insist, sir, that you give them to me. The cut occurs going directly to a close-up of Ripper's face for intimidation. Then, to a close-up of an inanimate object for introducing tension. Do I take it, sir, that you are threatening a bother officer with a gun? As Mandrake and Ripper's conversation has now become intensified, Kubrick sticks to shot-reverse shot of both characters framed in a close-up. And since Ripper has the power over the scene, the shot length rests on him for far longer than it does on Mandrake. Kubrick's method for filming conversations isn't necessarily revolutionary, but he is someone who holds the shot for as long as he can. He opts to frame both characters with a wide or track with them and only cuts to a character's face for intimacy or intensity. And this method of simplicity and patience can be applied to almost every aspect of Kubrick's films. For the iconic Kubrick stare, the character in question is shot central to the frame and usually looks directly into the lens or slightly off-center. It's usually used to judge how far a character has progressed into insanity. So when a character is delving into insanity, the character looks off-center and Kubrick uses a zoom in to raise tension. But when a character is already too far gone, the character looks directly into the lens and the shot holds dead solid without any movement. He also likes scenes that take place in bathrooms. In regards to his personal reputation in films, Kubrick can be somewhat daunting. Many called him a perfectionist and someone who is too detail-oriented, but his films speak for themselves, and when you break down Kubrick's use of framing and dialogue in large-scale scenes, it's easier to understand his approach toward filmmaking. He had a desire to film characters and events not as they could be, but as they were, and to make each shot stand out like a work of art. He never made the same picture twice. Every single picture is a different genre, a different period, a different story, a different risk. The only thing that bonded all of his films was the incredible virtuoso that he was with craft and with editing and with performance and with camera placement and with composition. But every single story was different. I see a 